The following recorded program is part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center Lecture Series, offered by Mount Sinai Medical Center in cooperation with the City of Sunny Isles Beach. My name is Richard Rowe, um, and like Regina mentioned, I'm one of the cardiologists over at Mount Sinai. Uh, I did much of my training in New York and came down here to practice. So we're going to be talking about hypertension or high blood pressure today. Um, I'm sure it's something that we're all familiar with, um, either in our own personal history or friend, family, or loved one that has high blood pressure. So. High blood pressure, it's a pretty common condition. Um, it affects up to 30%, maybe even more, of the population. And that comes up to about 78, 76 to even 80 million Americans. A lot of people, uh, up to 20 million Americans, have it, and they don't even know that they have it. So we call them undiagnosed hypertension. So you might have heard about new guidelines and what we define as hypertension or high blood pressure. So a normal blood pressure is having a systolic, or that top number that you see, under 120, and then a diastolic, that bottom number, under 80. And the way that we measure it is millimeters of mercury. So the normal blood pressure should be under 120 over 80. The new, the new guidelines, um, they mention that having an elevated blood pressure is having a systolic blood pressure. So once again, that's that top number. If it's from 120 to 129, and then if you have a higher diastolic blood pressure, we're going into the 80 plus range. You know, before there used to be stages of, of hypertension that were defined, you know, if you had a uh, uh, blood pressure over a certain number, you were described as prehypertension and then stage one and stage two. That's kind of stayed the same. So we still uh, define stage one hypertension as having a top number from 130 to 139. And then the stage two high blood pressure is having a systolic blood pressure over 140. So people always ask, what's the best way to check the blood pressure? If, if you're checking the blood pressure standing up, and then there are kids running around you screaming, and the TV is playing like some news that's upsetting to you in the background, and uh, you know, you're trying to also do another thing at the same time, you're not checking the blood pressure the right way. So what we should be doing is we should be seated for five minutes, both of our feet should be flat on the ground. Our backs should be supported. It should be in a quiet setting where there's no one around you. Um, you shouldn't have a cup of coffee or smoke a cigarette before, because having one of those things within 30 minutes to an hour of checking your blood pressure will make your blood pressure higher than it truly is. When we check the blood pressure in both arms, and there is a slight difference. We actually take the blood pressure of the arm that's higher as your official blood pressure. Another question that I, I commonly get is, um, which number should I worry about? Should I worry about the top number? Should I worry about the bottom number? Um, you know, we look at both numbers. But when we studied um, people who've had isolated uh, elevations in one number, like either the systolic or diastolic numbers, we saw that as we were older, um, we're more concerned about the top number, the systolic. We saw that the higher that was, the higher risk of something bad happening, like heart attack or stroke. Um, in patients who are younger, under the age of 50, um, having a higher diastolic or bottom number blood pressure is also linked with more heart events over time. But kind of to simplify that answer to that question, we're a lot more concerned about the top number as we age. 
All right. Um, one thing that we always also see, you know, especially in the office, is something called white coat hypertension. So you know, I'm sure this has all happened to you at one point, or you know of someone who, who's experienced this. They go to the office, the blood pressure is 20, 30 points higher than it is when they check it at home. You check it again at the end of the visit, it's still a little bit high, and then you, know, you might be worried about that. But this is a pretty common phenomenon. Um, it's something about maybe being in the office, uh, driving, finding parking, you know, worried that you're going to be on time, or you know, maybe a little anxious because you're waiting for the doctor to come and you've sat in the room for 15, 20, 30 minutes. So a lot of things can possibly contribute to this high blood pressure in the office. Um, one thing that we can do to see if it truly is just high blood pressure in the office versus high blood pressure at home, we have you check your blood pressures at home. There also is something called an ambulatory blood pressure monitor where we have you wear a device and it continually checks your blood pressure throughout the day. So it can be a little bit cumbersome, you know, as you can imagine if you're getting your blood pressure checked constantly throughout the day, but it does give us the information that we need. Okay, so quick quiz, which of these increases our chances of getting high blood pressure? Increasing age, obesity or weight gain, family history, genetics, race, high salt diet, excess alcohol, inta excess alcohol intake more than two drinks a day, physical inactivity, diabetes, stress, depression. Which of these can cause high blood pressure? Right, exactly. So all of them, unfortunately. So. Um, there's definitely a link in terms of family history, your weight. Um, as we get older, we see that high blood pressure is more common. Um, we see that some races uh, have a higher prevalence or a percentage of patients that have high blood pressure, uh, for example, like African Americans. Um, we also see that people who do have a higher salt diet are more likely to have high blood pressure. Of course, we all know about the alcohol, alcohol intake and how physical activity is linked with weight and obesity and uh, blood pressure. The other thing with physical activity is that we do know that aerobic exercise, so your cardio, bike, walk, jogging, anything like that, does lower the blood pressure. Um, diabetes, and then a huge thing that I see is stress, you know, um, in all of my patients, in all ages. I mean, stress is a huge thing, and being acutely in stress or chronically in stress raises your blood pressure. Um, there are other causes of high blood pressure to think about. Um, other medicines, like steroids, uh, decongestants, um, contraceptives for younger patients, uh, young women, um, and non steroidal anti inflammatories such as ibuprofen or Advil. So, those are things to kind of keep in the back of the mind. Um, some decongestants that, uh, that improve, like a runny nose that you'd get with allergies or something like that, like a Sudafed, it closes the blood vessels. That's how it decreases your, the running of your nose. But when it closes down the blood vessels, it also causes your blood pressure to go up. Um, we also know that chronic use of medicines like ibuprofen, Advil, also can raise your blood pressure. You know, I certainly hope no one's using cocaine or methamphetamines, um, but that can also raise the blood pressure. Other more insidious or kind of silent cause of high blood pressure is sleep apnea where um, if we're not familiar with sleep apnea, it's a condition where while you sleep, your airway becomes obstructed, and that causes people to snore loudly, or even severe cases, stop breathing at night. When people stop breathing at night, or they snore loudly, their oxygen levels go down, your body's in a stress state. You don't sleep well. You feel tired during the day, and because of all that, your blood pressure also goes up. So um, if you notice that your partner or someone in the family snores very loudly, even stops breathing, where I've had some, 
some people be worried that their partner is still alive and breathing and kind of shake them awake. Um, that's another cause of high blood pressure. And then, of course, kidney disease. Um, for example, people who are on dialysis, uh, they're more prone to high blood pressure. Um, why, do we, why do we care that the blood pressure is high? Um, the reason why is it's one of the risk factors for heart disease, so heart attack. Um, over time, as your heart is working very hard, if your blood pressure is very high, 160s, 170s, you know, systolic, the top number, your heart muscle becomes thicker. And even over time, besides the heart muscle becoming very thick, the heart muscle can become weak. So we call that heart failure. Or we developed something called congestive heart failure, the other name. Um, it also increases the risk of a stroke. And the high blood pressure also affects the kidneys. So people who have high blood pressure for a very long time, we can see that the kidney numbers start to get worse and worse and worse, and then, you know, heaven forbid, people need dialysis as a result. Who should we check? Simply everyone should be checked, especially if you're the age of 40, um, even younger. Um, we routinely check blood pressures in the office. And then if you have any other symptoms that would be concerning for high blood pressure, like headaches, change in vision, pain in the chest, pressure in the chest, that's the first thing that we would check. Okay, so um, for someone that is noted to have high blood pressure, what do we do in the office? So what does someone like me do or your primary care doctor do if, you, if we see that your blood pressure is very high? So we check basic blood work, your kidney function, your thyroid, your blood count, anything that would kind of give us a reason as to why the blood pressure is high. Because we're always worried about the possibility of heart disease, we look for other risk factors. We check your cholesterol, your sugar, we talk about your family history, we make sure you're not smoking. Um, and then there are a couple of tests that we can, we can do to see the effect, if any, that high blood pressure has had on the body. Um, the first test is an electrocardiogram. It's a very common test where we have you lay down, put a bunch of stickers on the chest, and then a machine spits out a piece of paper that uh, tells us what your electrical rhythm of your heart is. Uh, a more sophisticated test is an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. Um, the ultrasound of the heart is a little bit different. Uh, the echo is different from the EKG, the electrocardiogram. Um, the echo, we have you lay on your left side, we put a probe on your chest, and we're actually able to image your heart in real time. So we can see if your heart muscle is thick, we can look at your valves, um, so we can see if any part of your heart structure has been affected by the blood pressure being high. Um, so just say we've been told, oh, your blood pressure is high, what do we do? The first step, it's not to give medicines. In the rare case that the blood pressure is extremely high, uh, 180, 190, then it would be a good idea to start medicines. Or if the blood pressure is high and you have symptoms, if you feel bad, vision's changed, trouble breathing, dizzy, lightheaded, then we would treat the blood pressure with medicines. But the first step, we always try to treat without medicines. And what we do is something called therapeutic lifestyle changes. So we would focus on decreasing the salt in the diet, uh, try to cut down the weight, increase the physical activity, increase aerobic exercise, you know, walking, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, if possible. I mean, if you live on the 20th floor, obviously you're not gonna take the stairs, right? Um, but anything that you can do helps. Um, cutting down the alcohol that you drink. You know, if you do drink more than two or three drinks a day, then, you know, that's something that we would want to cut down. Um, and then we do something called the DASH diet, which is called the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Diet, and then we'll kind of briefly talk about it. Uh, and then kind of back to that low salt, cutting down the salt in the diet. So this is a quick example of the DASH diet. Um, it, it, the, the focus is more on your, your leaner proteins, um, kind of avoidance of red meat, which has more kind of saturated fats. 
more fruits and vegetables in that corner, you know, healthier snack options like nuts, seeds, and then, uh, you know, other proteins like fish. Um, these are the kind of foods that won't necessarily help, you know, red meat, um, you know, soda, uh, juice, a lot of uh, higher sugar containing uh, drinks. Uh, in that corner on the right, there's a Dasani water bottle, which is fine. Um, but the other four bottles I would stay away from, definitely. Foods that are higher in calories, like your candy, your fried foods, you know, all of this leads to either weight gain, uh, increased salt in the diet. These are not things that will help the blood pressure. The other thing that we, we ask patients to start doing is um, looking at nutrition labels. Um, a lot of food contains more salt than we think. And especially canned foods. Um, and one thing that we can do is we can see what the sodium content is. So for example, this label um, shows one cup is a serving, 470 milligrams of sodium in this one serving, and that's 20% of your daily value. So if you have two cups and you finish the entire container, in one sitting, you've already gotten 40% of your sodium for the day. So that's a huge amount already in just kind of one container. So um, the general recommendation is we should have less than two milligrams of salt per day. If we can do less than that, that's even better. Okay, if all else fails, then what do we do? Then that's when we talk about medications. Um, so we've already tried to, to lose the weight, and of course we all know that's, that's not easy. We've tried to maximize the physical activity, sleep better, stay away from stress, but you know, sometimes we have high blood pressure and we're just not able to improve it with our therapeutic lifestyle changes. That's when we talk about taking medicines. And you know, there's a number of medicines. Uh, they all work in different ways to lower the blood pressure. They all have their own side effects. You know, some people can tolerate these medicines. Some people get every side effect that's listed in the book with that particular medicine. Uh, and that kind of just shows, you know, everybody's different and we all respond to medicines in different ways. Okay, another big question that I get is, um, should I take my medications in the morning or night? So um, there's no real difference that's been noted if you take a medicine that is supposed to last 24 hours, that you take once a day, if you take it at morning or night. Sometimes people do better with certain medicines taking at night versus the day. Like some blood pressure medicines, a side effect is it makes you tired. So those medicines, generally, we could take during the night and see how it affects our energy level. Because sometimes if you take those medicines during the day, people feel that they can't do much during the course of the day. Um, if you do take more than one medicine for high blood pressure, um, you can break, break it up. Take one in the morning, take one in the evening so that you're not taking both of those medicines at the same time and the blood pressure doesn't go too low during the course of the day. <clears throat> and then certain blood pressure medicines in the way that they work, some of them can make you pee more. So, you know, those are medicines that you should definitely take during the day and not at night because we all want to sleep at night and not run to the bathroom at night. Another uh, very f common question I get is when should I check my blood pressure? So also in the, these, this, this latest guideline from the American Heart Association, it's recommended to check the blood pressure in the morning um, before you take your medicine. And then uh, once again in the early evening, uh, before dinner, supper. Uh, and then make sure that you've already done all the things that we talked about before, which is seated, quiet setting, you know, arm at the level of your heart. Make sure you have a blood cuff, blood pressure cuff that fits your arm. Um, you know, 
don't have a cup of coffee before, turn the TV off. Just take a couple of minutes and check the blood pressure the right way. Good. Um, any, this is my dog um, who, uh, when she doesn't listen, my blood pressure goes up. But um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Do you want to see us questions now? Yes, yes. Actually, I think um, there might be a microphone. Is there a link between increased cholesterol mm. and blood pressure, not narrow vessels? Because chole increased cholesterol is particles in the blood mm -hmm. moving around. Yeah. Have they done studies on the link between that? That's my first question. Please. Okay. okay. So the question was, is there a link between uh, increased cholesterol and blood pressure? So, I mean, cholesterol is a tricky topic because, you know, most people have high cholesterol because they produce it. And then also, based on the food that we eat, also affects your cholesterol. So, um, people can have either high cholesterol or high blood pressure separately. Um, in terms of a possible link, unfortunately, a lot of patients that I see um, are perhaps a little overweight and maybe don't follow the best diet, you know, like a lot of processed foods like your McDonald's or your Burger King or something like that. Um, and as a result of them being overweight, not following the best diet, which besides being high in cholesterol also is high in salt, they might have both conditions. They might have a cholesterol that's poorly controlled and a blood pressure that's high. So, you know, everything is kind of connected in a way. So things like weight and your diet, your genetics, all of those can cause both of those conditions. And sometimes they can happen at the same time. It's actually quite common they happen at the same time. So does one cause the other? Not directly. No. Yeah, but there's always some, there's other things that can cause I both. I guess I wasn't talking about those. That's why ah. I tried. I tried to isolate it. Yeah. For example, a person who has a genetic predisposition for high cholesterol that has not already adhered to the vessels. Yeah. You know, can, maybe they don't have high blood pressure, but their cholesterol is high. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, maybe they have a, also some predisposition to not having their cholesterol adhere to their vessels. Yeah, I mean... So then they could never have high blood pressure, or never as absolute as... I'm sorry, yeah, nothing's absolute. Nothing is absolute, you're right. right. But, you right. know, I have some patients who are like 20 or 30 years old. Their blood pressures are perfect, you know, but they have a genetic predisposition or they have a genetic form of high cholesterol. cholesterol. Yeah, so... Um, it can definitely occur in isolation, more commonly occurs together. I, well, it, following up on that, and then I'll, do, I'll go, come back if I, we have time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you treat that person, that 20-year-old that has no high blood pressure, yeah. but a high cholesterol? Yeah, it, it matters. So if, if the cholesterol is greater than 190, generally we would treat the, we would treat the bad cholesterol, I mean the LDL cholesterol. We would treat the cholesterol. And then, you know, other things that would make us want to treat the cholesterol more aggressively is, especially if it's familial, that 20-year-old with a high cholesterol, you know, oh, my dad had a heart attack when he was 40. We're probably going to start treating you earlier so that you don't get a heart attack at 40 as well. So, um, I mean, we have, to, we have to tailor a lot of treatment, you know, to the patient as an individual. Because, you know, you're, you're not the same as someone in the row behind you. Right, so um, you know, it, there's a lot of kind of considerations that we have to talk with each person. I am going to ask one more question, and that's it. Then I'll stop there. Um, what's the mechanism of high blood pressure and sleep apnea? Is it only stress? Mm. You know, because you have it when you're sleeping, and you don't when you're up. Yeah. So why does it cause high blood pressure? Yeah. So I mean, sleep apnea. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so sleep apnea is just—it's not great. Because, um, for one, you don't get restful sleep at night. And we all need to sleep at night. Um, the other thing is, uh, we see that the oxygen levels go down in your blood because your airway is being obstructed. 
and then you snore, and then you don't breathe. So when your oxygen levels go down at night, you know, your body doesn't know if you have sleep apnea or if someone's putting a pillow over your face, right? So it's, it, it's a stress state, you know? And then um, your body tries to adapt if your oxygen levels are chronically low by making you wake up, you know, breathing more rapidly. Uh, there's effects on your, your heart and your, uh, the right side of your heart particularly that happen over time with chronic sleep apnea. So um, it's a combination of things, like the, the stress of the situation itself, not sleeping well, the decreased oxygen levels at night, um, all of that can contribute. And then also the people that have sleep apnea more often than not are a little bit larger than most because something obstructs the airway. So it's excess soft tissue in the, in the neck or something like that. So you're welcome.